Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Anthony Waste Handling Cell Limited Q2 FY24 Earnings Conference Call. This conference call may contain forward-looking statements about the company which are based on the beliefs, opinions, and expectations of the company as on date of this call. These statements are not the guarantees of future performance and involve risks and uncertainties that are difficult to predict. As a reminder, all participant lines will be on the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Jose Jacob, Chairman and Managing Director of Anthony Waste Handling Cell Limited. Thank you and over to you. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our Q2 FY24 earnings conference call. With me, I have Mr. Saiki Jacob, Executive Director and Chief Risk Officer, Mr. Mandra Anantula, Group President, Operation Business Development and Diversification, Mr. Subramanian, our Group's CFO, and SGA, our Investor Relations Advisor. Our investor presentation for second quarter of 2024 is now available on the website of the Stock Exchange List and also on our company website. First and foremost, I want to emphasize that our strong financial performance continued in our second quarter with another all-time high quarterly co-operation revenue of 200 crores. Representing a 25% year-on-year increase with a steady growth strategy going forward. Notably, we continue to work to improve our operational efficiency, which is reflected in our improved EBITDA margins, which has increased by 210 basis points to 24.5% on year-on-year basis. Despite facing inflationary pressure on our cost segment, we have successfully maintained and improved our EBITDA margins partially due to increased volumes. We are working hard to strengthen the revenue streams that underpin our business while also demonstrating our unwavering commitment to rigorously optimizing our cost structure. The core EBITDA margins achieved in the Q2 of were are consistent with our previous guidance, reinforcing our confidence in long-term stability and growth. The management has initiated a corporate restructuring with an aim at reducing managerial overlap. The board has proposed combining Anthony Infrastructure and Base Management Services Private Limited and KAE into AG Envido. All of those, all of these are under person boldly own subsidiary of the listed entity. The merger aims to achieve a more straightforward corporate structure improve operational and managerial efficiency, leverage combined assets for a more robust and a sustainable business, and realize cost savings while utilizing valuable resources more efficiently. With this, we plan to achieve a cleaner organizational structure. Our company is poised to embark on a promising growth strategy trajectory. The company is actively pursuing opportunities in CNT, which is collection and transportation, and biomining projects. And it expects to provide a positive update on some of them in the coming quarters. Furthermore, we are on track to diversify our revenue stream by offering complementary services. In a similar vein, we will launch a construction and demolition, collection, transporting, processing, and disposal projects in Q4 FY24. Thank you, and now I hand over the call to Old and director of Mr. Saiju Jacob. Thank you, Josh, and good afternoon to all who have uh, joined us on this call. In, th in our line of work, maintaining close uh, collaboration with the various stakeholders and ensuring the delivery of top notch services are of utmost uh, significance. A crucial aspect of this involves uh, ensuring full compliance of our vehicles addressing strategy reviews and ad adhering to all contractual obligations mutually agreed upon with our clients. 
equally important is our focus on managing receivables it's not worry that uh, some multiple corporations still face challenges in constituting their uh, standing committee due to the uh, the absence of elected members this has been an uh, historical issue and our management has diligently worked to address it the positive outcomes of these efforts were evident in the last few quarters an escalation amount from one corporation uh, initially unapproved due to the lack of appropriate authority has now been resolved we have received a portion of the escalation in q1 amounting to 7 crores indian rupees and in the current quarter we have received acknowledgement for an additional 12 crores rupees for the previous year period we are actively engaged with other municipal corporation to uh, corporations to ensure similar acknowledgements directly contributing to the company's margin outlook as per our guidance guidance turning to our new business endeavors our management continues to implement a cluster approach while our legacy business maintains its expected performance we have successfully secured new contracts in the cnt and mechanical sweeping sectors a recent highlight is our winning of a cnt contract valued at 386 crores from panmen municipal corporation in the mmr region in the five year contract with the option of a two year extension the corporation takes responsibility for all capital expenditures associated with the project enabling us to adopt an asset light model and redirect capital resources to other promising opportunities this contract win builds on top of the recent lee to contract backed by the group the two mechanical sweeping contracts one from pimpri chinchwar municipal corporation involved the mechanical sweeping uh, street sweeping of major roads above 18 meters in dcmc area for a seven year concession period at a cost of 80 crores and another one from nagpur corporation these wins not only provide uh, traction for future growth but also contribute significantly to our goal of achieving a 20 to 25% compounded annual growth rate in our core revenues in conclusion these uh, strategic uh, Uh, initiated to underscore our commitment to operational excellence financial prudence and sus- sustainable growth we are confident that our focused efforts will continue to yield uh, positive results and drive the company towards greater success thank you and i now hand over the call to mahendra An- anantula our group president operations and business development hi the over to you Thank you, Shalu, and good afternoon to all. I would like to share the remarkable achievements of our Kandil facility and the recent commissioning of our state-of-the-art waste energy plant at Pimpri Chinchwar Municipal Corporation. In the last quarter, our Kandil facility has witnessed significant progress. The volume of municipal solid waste process experienced a noteworthy improvement, reaching about 6,000 tons per day at an average, showcasing a remarkable increase of around 14%. This announcement can be attributed not only to the improvement in MSW processing volume, but also to the strategic use of the sanitary landfill facility. Moreover, we have achieved record-breaking dispatches of refuse derived fuel, that is RDF, totaling an impressive 59,000 tons. The surge in RDF dispatches can be attributed to the growing demand, which also resulted in a marginal increase in revenue. <coughs> It is worth noting that while the sale of RDF typically contributes lower margins compared to a processing arm, its financial role in waste management cannot be overstated. However, the actual result of our recent endeavors is the successful commissioning of our cutting-edge waste energy plant at the Pimpri Chinchwar Municipal Corporation, effectively this quarter. This innovative facility has uh, already embarked on a transformative journey by initiating commercial power sales. Supplying up to 8 megawatts of power to vital PCMC infrastructure assets, including the rabbit water pumping station and the chippery sewage treatment plant. 
it is it is it is essential to highlight that these power sales commenced on 2nd october and therefore the reported numbers for the second quarter do not capture the significant development our waste generating facilities power not only contributes to a cleaner environment but also plays a crucial role in ensuring the uninterrupted operation of these critical systems as we progress towards the end of fiscal year our plan is to gradually gradually increase the power supply ultimately supplying almost 11.76 megawatts this expansion represents a monumental step towards creating a greener and more sustainable energy ecosystem the positive impact of this initiative cannot be understated as the green energy generated is estimated to save approximately 7 lakh tons of carbon dioxide emissions annually equal to the emissions of around 1.5 lakh passenger cars in the initial testing phase the plant has shown promising results generating approximately 2.9 uh, million uh, uh, units of power and achieving a plant load factor of about 70% our commitment to excellence is further demonstrated by our ongoing efforts to rigorously test all aspects of the plants aiming to take a full load and seeking clarification for fitness from Hitachi Jordan our esteemed technical partners in conclusion these achievements underscore our dedication to environmental sustainability innovation and a commitment to creating a better and greener future i extend my gratitude to each one of you for this amazing support on this transformation journey journey and i believe that this will continue in future as well but let me also add that we are extremely delighted to provide an update on the operational performance of entering the final phase in the second quarter of fiscal year 24 our company and its subsidiary uh, successfully managed an impressive 1.15 million tons of waste showcasing a remarkable man percent year on year increase this growth can be attributed to the full scale implementation of operations in newly acquired partner the capture of our existing cnp site and an increase in tonnage process in our waste processing operations specifically in the collection transportation business segment we efficiently handled 0.45 million tons in quarter 2 of the 2024 reflecting a commendable 7% increase compared to the previous year furthermore our waste processing business managed 0.70 million tons marking an 11% increase over the previous year on the rdf front this quarter our uh, rdf sales reached a new milestone totally totaling approximately 29000 tons which is a significant increase compared to about 10500 tons in the same period last year and about 27800 tons in quarter 1 of in the previous quarter additionally we sold around 2200 tons of compost during the quarter although these figures topped on a year on year basis due to reduced fertilizer demand in maharashtra and gujarat influenced by a weaker than expected monsoon but our operational performance remains robust In terms of emissions, our scope one emissions increased from 5,830 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in quarter one to 6,374 tons in quarter two, in line with the rise in tonnage handle. Meanwhile, our scope two emissions decreased from 891 tons in quarter one to 625 tons in quarter two, reflecting fewer bio mining and shedding activities. Our commitment to emission reduction is evident with avoided emissions of 1,379 tons in quarter one. and 1260 tons in quarter 2 our ground staff strength is at 9814 and with the commencement of the panvel project we anticipate surpass, we anticipate surpassing the 10000 mark on the panvel front we have undertaken uh, we have already uh, taken over several vehicles from the corporation and initiated operations from november 1st handling approximately 420 tons per day these activities align seamlessly with our expectations marking a positive stride in our commitment to environmental sustainability and extending efficient waste management practices to our clients we continue to actively pursue opportunities in cnt and bio mining projects reflecting our firm commitment to sustainability and creating value for our stakeholders on to the financial aspect let me get ng involved here in this overview Thank you, Mahendra. Uh, in the second quarter of financial year 2024, the company achieved a significant milestone, as mentioned by Joe. We had an operating revenue of 200 crores, a robust 25% increase compared to 161 crores in the last, same period last year. 
On a half yearly basis, the company reported an operating revenue of 379 crores, marking a substantial 20% growth from 317 in the same period last year. The impressive revenue growth is largely attributable to the substantial increase in volumes handled. Uh, in the, on the consolidated EBITDA front, uh, the group exhibited a noteworthy growth of 23% uh, to 57 crores in second quarter compared to 46 crores in second quarter of last year and with the EBITDA margin of 25% which reflects a significant increase of 210 bips from the last year period. For the first time, the company registered a growth of 15% in EBITDA to 109 crores. The core EBITDA also displayed robust growth uh, surging 28% to in second quarter of the current current financial year to 55 crores as compared to 43 crores in the same period last year. The core EBITDA margins uh, stood at 25%. Excluding the escalation component of the previous period, the core EBITDA would align with the management's past guidance standing at around 21.6%. The profit after tax for second quarter reached uh, 32 crores up from 28 crores last year and for the first half it stands at around 54 crores. As of September 23, uh, the group's total debt is around 370 crores, net debt is around 294 crores, indicating a net debt to equity ratio of 0.4x. The weighted cost of debt is around 9.1%. During the first half, the total cash flow from operations stood at uh, 92.5 crores, which is a substantial increase from 30 crores for the same period last year. Day sales outstanding remain at similar levels compared to the previous quarter. The company's focus continues to center on enhancing operational efficiency, improving liquidity, and fostering a positive financial environment in line with the goal of achieving a 20-25% CAGR rate in core operating revenues in a sustainable manner. That's all from our side. Now we can open the floor for Q&A. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Participants present on the audio bridge who wish to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question comes from Bhavya Gandhi from Taral and Broadchurch Stoke Broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you for taking my questions and congratulations on good set of numbers. So my first question is related to vehicle scrapping because I see in your investor presentation that you put a slide on vehicle scrapping. If you could show some light, what kind of opportunity are we looking out in vehicle scrapping land uh, that we require? And what kind of revenue are we targeting, or any any you know early signs? Yeah, that's it from my end. That is first question. And another is with respect to debt. I'll take it later. Yeah. So hi, uh, thank you for your question. I mean, although we are we are uh, very bullish about this vehicle strapping facility as a business line because we don't uh, we not only feel that this is a project which or this is a business line which probably will add value to our uh, portfolio in the near future. But going forward, this entire recycling theme uh, is something that we are very positive about. Specifically on auto cycling, uh, auto recycling. I mean, we have uh, we are on the drawing board stage. We have uh, we are trying to find the minimum uh, viable product, identifying the vendors and equipment. Uh, in terms of uh, and, and we also have zeroed down on a couple of locations where we would set up our first plant. So if all goes well, I think we can, we should be able to make some positive uh, announcement on this front by the end of this year. So uh, would this, this business would be similar to our uh, company level ROCEs only, or uh, will it be lower or higher if you can throw some light on this? You know, so the, the, the jury is still out on, the, on these projects. I mean, what we feel is that Project facing in the initial few years, uh, and then going forward, I mean, the, the, the main critical success factor of this of this kind of project is sourcing of vehicles, sourcing of the vehicles that need to be scrapped. Okay, uh, so what we believe is that when we have a portfolio of about four or five projects, and we have a considerable experience in in sourcing of these vehicles, 
and tying up with suitable entities for sale of scrap. Okay, that's when we will have uh, some decent numbers to talk about. So at this stage, we do not want to say anything about uh, specific viability of these projects on an individual basis. But I think going forward, in five years from now, this should be a very profitable business segment. Sure. And uh, basically, our clientele would not be corporation over here, but would be some private players. Uh, so right? This is one of the reasons that, no, not, 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 not really. So, uh, and this is one of the reasons that why we are looking forward to uh, do more of these recycling projects because we want to add our non municipal revenue. Right, right. And are we looking at any other opportunities besides vehicle scrapping having, you know, sort of non government revenue because that, you know, significantly reduces our data dependency on uh, corporations? Yes, so vehicle recycling and, and tire recycling are two specific opportunities that we are starting with. Of course, there were many, many uh, segments that we uh, initially uh, had long listed. And then also we looked at plastics and batteries and so on. Uh, but out of that long list, we decided to first attempt auto and tires because that also has a lot of synergies with our uh, existing business where we handle so many products. Perfect. And with respect to your outstanding debt, if I'm not wrong, you mentioned about 294 crores of net debt, right? So how much is outstanding for more than a year? And uh, if you can throw some light from which corporations is it outstanding and how long do we expect it to recover it back? Yeah, so um, we are talking about the total debt at that point of time, not debtors. So, yeah. So, if you're talking about debtors amount, I mean, the total outstanding is uh, uh, around 110 crores, which is less than six months period. Less than six months. And uh, more than six months? More than six months is around 88 crores, which includes retention money and minimum wage reimbursement. Okay. And any which are, uh, you know, f uh, facing any issues or litigations or any dispute, uh, disputed amount? Yeah, that is around 6.8 crores for which, uh, which is a qualified line item which is mentioned in the note. So these are old dues which are gone into arbitration, which have been settled in favor of the company. Now we have not realized the money because it's in uh, it's either in the Bombay High Court or it's in the Supreme Court uh, jurisdiction. So once the rulings come across, we will be able to realize the money from these two entities. Perfect. And so one last question from my end with respect to construction debris. That project is supposed to start in December, if I'm not wrong? No. Uh, as per the contract, we are supposed to start it by middle of February. Middle of February. Okay, and that's the only one contract which has been awarded as of now. And uh, do we expect further contracts in this space as well? Uh, there are many cities who are who are uh, in the I mean planning for their construction debris recycling project. So, but yes, we had, as of now we have only one project. But going forward, we'll be looking forward to uh, getting more. And similar set of margins and ROC levels. They are similar, yeah. Uh, a more of a capex mode or an opex mode if you can just uh, broadly guide on that most of the time the processing contracts are on a capex mode because the corporation will give you only land i mean that is like the biggest cost of any transaction right so they will give you land and then they will ask you to uh, set up the plant and do the momentum part of it but in large waste processing contracts we have seen that that is a element of capital grant that is involved it could be anywhere between a 10 to 50 percent of the total capital outlay but it's again very uh, uh, corporation specific and tender specific okay got it thank you so much i'll get back in the queue thank you so much the next question comes from Ashu from xpash please go ahead The person you are speaking with. The next question comes from Anj Manek from Equity Securities Private Limited. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Thanks for the opportunity and congratulations for a good set of numbers. 
sir i would like to have the update with respect to the uh, collection part for few of the municipal corporation where we have made the provision of around 20 crores in fy 23 yeah so we have already realized around 15 crores from the old receivables from one of the corporations in the last 7 months and uh, there is a written confirmation from the client that the balance will be repaid uh, within the end of the current financial year and maybe by the first half of the next financial year so 25% of the old receivables have already been uh, received by the company in that aspect so uh, uh, if i recollect during the last quarter we received around 6 crores so uh, 15 crores for the first half would uh, result into the 9 crores received during the second quarter right sir yeah so uh, for during the second quarter we have realized out a tune of around 12 crores actually this is for a period of december 21 till march 2023 so that's the previous year item which we have recognized that amount is around 12 crores So if you were to strip out that, our core operating uh, margin is still at a healthy 21.6 percent. Okay, got it, sir. Uh, second question is respect to the Mangalore project. So there were reports that the municipal corporation would be uh, issuing the fresh tender for the project. So any update on that part? So uh, the Mangalore corporation actually came up with a tender. They divided the city into four parts and came up with four projects. but then they were not too many they didn't get a good response and hence they have terminated that contract uh, or they t- terminated that uh, tender uh, so as we speak i mean our contract is till january of 2024 okay and the client is now uh, looking forward to bidding it out again at the city wide level but as of now they have not given us any uh, deadline in terms of by when they would do that and uh, what would be the outstanding amount for this specific project as of date for mangalore the total outstanding amount is around 48 crores 48 okay. okay sir and sir my last question would be with respect to the construction and debris contract uh, so uh, if you can highlight the process of the contract what would be the uh, what would be the by products like this we have in kanchimak RDF and combo sale. So, do we have any other byproducts which would be also forming part of this type of contract? So, in the case of the CNG project that we have with uh, NCGN, our mm-hmm. revenue model is essentially is hinging on the processing fee or the tipping fee which the client is going to give us. So, that is going to be the primary revenue. Now, uh, coming to byproducts in in all CNG projects, the byproducts are sand and aggregates. okay which are sold to the construction companies and or used it to make value added products like paper blocks tiles and things like that so that's the second line of revenue stream so that you can say uh, is similar to the rdf and compost business in the kanjur facility so we'll have two revenue streams but bulk of the revenue and the project is the bulk of the revenue will come from the tipping fees and the project is viable on its own based on tipping fees whatever comes by selling of the fan aggregates or value added products comes to the next side that would be an next side okay okay sir uh, that's that's all from my side thank you sir all the best thank you if you wish to ask a question you may press star 1 on your touchstone telephone if you wish to remove yourself from the question queue you may press star 2 The next question comes from Harshil from Exparsh. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. The loud and clear. Yeah. So, so I have seen the results. So, I have uh, one question that we have, we wrote back uh, excess liabilities of nine crores uh, during earlier end of September twenty three, which you can find it in cash flow statement, right? So the EBITDA percentage that we are considering right now, is it that EBITDA percentage including this nine crores or excluding this nine crores? The uh, the amount is not fully been uh, written back because that period is of uh, multiple corporations and for multiple time plans. So the only amount that we have written back is of six point seven eight crores in the first quarter. In the second quarter, the entire amount of 12 crores was not provided for in the past at all. So that was no provision to be made because we didn't recognize this escalation 
since there was no standing committee in any of the corporations where this matter was pending. So once the corporation had given us an in-signal principle about, uh, we have recognized the same in the first and in the second quarter. Uh, so, so my point here is that EBITDA percent that we are considering right now, or the EBITDA number that we are considering, whether this is including uh, this uh, 9 crores uh, provision which we wrote back or excluding this 9 crores. So the reported EBITDA, the core EBITDA margin of 25.6% includes the escalation amount that we have received. If you were to strip out the escalation of the prior period, that is still March 2020, if you were to remove that, our core EBITDA margin is 21.6%. Okay, okay, I, I understand. So, so I apologize again uh, because if you see, if you see open, you, if you open your cash flow statement, right, you can find one line item of so, excess provision broad base of approximately nine crores credit. That nine crores credit is there in your cash flow. So if you open it. Utilized. That has not been utilized because that is our ECL provisioning that we have kept. Okay, so that is the ECL provision, right? That is an additional provision, right? Yeah, that is an additional provision which has been kept. Yeah, so we wrote, we wrote it back in uh, this year. No, no, we have not included that. And as a policy, the company, uh, the board has uh, suggested that we create an ECL provisioning because of the variability in the revenue recognition pattern. Given the past experiences, as a prudent uh, accounting policy, we have started creating an ECL provisioning which is equal to around 1 to 1.5% 1 of the revenue. So that's how this kind of works out. It's also case specific, but that's the nature of the process here. Uh, another question that I would have that we, we had, I have seen the annual report for March 2023 and March 2022. I have seen that we are, uh, we are significantly irregular or delayed in payment of secretary dues. Because if you see your accounts for the March 23, right, we have approximately paid around 70 lakhs or 80 lakhs rupees towards delayed payment of secretary dues. Yeah, so, so I, let me please no. explain to you the reason why there is a delay in the payment of the statutory dues. These are predominantly related to a mismatch in the name of the UAN number of the Provident Fund employees. So what happens is uh, in uh, January 2022 and in 2023 onwards, it was mandatory that the PF uh, portal be seeded with the Aadhaar number of the employees and the PAN number. In bulk of our employees who are actually in the marginalized class of society, they don't have these details in place. The names uh, do have a mismatch. Uh, for example, uh, the Hazar card, the surnames are normally alphabets in our case. So that has been a mismatch. That is why the PF which has been deducted could not be paid to the PF portal. Now, this was the case for around 787 employees across our organization. The same has been addressed now. We have come down to around 82 employees. Then the same will be redressed and updated by the end of the current financial year. So this is something which is a problem from the PF portal where the company has not been able to uh, correctly upload the challenge in the name of the employee because of the name mismatch. Okay, I understand. But I, I have seen that in, for two consecutive years, March, in March 23 as well as in March 22. Yes, we so have a amount of churn in our business. The attrition rates are very high, it's around 22 to 24 percent. So a person who has worked in our site like a driver or a laborer, if he discontinues his work, then that amount still has to be sorted out. It is very difficult for our company to kind of chase a person and get his uh, documents and get it uploaded. So that is something that we are addressing. We have spoken to the PF commissioners and the authorities to f allow us to have an offline portal where we can provide these documents, get it signed by the uh, civil surgeon of the particular state to allow the change in name because most of these people don't even have school living certificates. They are either fifth standard dropouts and stuff like that. And the PF portal needs a school living certificate of 10th standard, which is proving to be a difficulty for us. So this on uh, these are actual problems that we are facing at the ground. We are also approaching the NIC to find a option where this can be done off uh, of the system so that we can uh, make it regularize the issue. Okay. Okay. And then there's one last question. And um, one last question that we are paying significantly high remuneration to non-executive directors because I have seen uh, the the remuneration that is being paid to non-executive directors towards commission and then attending board meetings and all that thing is one crore. So three directors, non-executive directors, we are paying uh, 30 lakhs, approximately 30, 30 lakhs each, each to each of the directors. 
So do you think that this this payment of such amount uh, uh, is justifiable considering the size and scale of the business, uh, nature of the business, uh, uh, this this quantum of remuneration is justified because. I have seen other companies, uh, you know, payment to non-equity directors, and it is not that as much as what we are, uh, what what I can see in in your company. Uh, sir, the nature of our business, the nature of work, the time and effort that goes into kind of working with the clients and managing the workload is significantly different. I'm, I'm not sure about the peer uh, comparison that you are making here, so I will not be in a position to compare whether it's nine or excess or below that. But uh, we feel that the, uh, the remuneration for the non-executive directors to be in line with the time and effort. If you look at the business potential, the kind of growth, the kind of traction, uh, it's, it's a difficult job. It's, uh, uh, the milk run starts at 5 in the morning. There are issues on the ground. The escalation is very rapid. So those things need to be tackled. Uh, unlike an industry like in cement or a steel industry where lateral recruits are possible. <laughs> in waste management, it's very difficult to get replacement of these people who have got more than two and a half decades of experience uh, in this business. Okay, and, and, okay. Uh, actually, uh, is, is this margin of 20, uh, 24 percent, is this including escalation or excluding uh, escalation? Sorry, uh, can you repeat that question? It's a 24 to 25 percent margin that we are, we are speaking, right? Is this including escalation cost or excluding escalation because of it? So this, uh, the reported margin of 25% is including the escalation. So if I were to strip out the escalation of the prior period, which is still March 22, which has been accounted now, the core operating margin would be around 22.6%. Okay. And, and how much is the escalation claim that we are expected to submit in next couple of months or next quarters? Uh, which means you have to be accounted. 14 crores, uh, 14 crores from a, uh, one corporation, the other corporation will be around similar lines. But uh, the timing of uh, the same is uh, something that the management will not be in a position to give today because it's, there are no standing committees, there are no elected members in those corporations. So it's, it's, it's likely to get delayed. Okay, and I do not, I don't have any other question. And uh, thank you, thank you for the uh, responding to my questions. Thank you. If you wish to ask a question, you may press star and one on your stuck stone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Your next question comes from Anj Manek from Equus Securities Private Limited. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the follow-up opportunity. Uh, sir, I have a question with respect to the sustainable core EBITDA margin in the mid to long term. So, a uh, sustainable margin for us, if escalations and everything come on time, the core sustainable operating margin would be in the range of 22 to 23 percent. I mean, 21 to 23 would be a very safe range for us to work with because 60 percent of our costs have escalations built into the system. So that kind of gets a fast to benefit. So on a sustainable manner, 21 to 22% is something which we can work. It's a EBITDA margin, right? So, or EBIT margin? EBITDA margin. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's it. Thank you. Your next question comes from Bhavya Gandhi from Allow and broadcast of broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, just wanted to know that any thoughts on repaying the debt uh, in the long term? I mean, uh, do we want to be like a debt-free company or will debt keep sitting on our books? Because for our further growth, because I, as I understand, if our ROCs are lower than the rate of revenue growth, I mean, every year either we'll have to do dilution for further growth or rely on debt. So, I mean, if you can throw some light on this, because we'll be growing faster than our ROP or ROE rates, right? So, yeah, so that problem is a multi flying one. So, yeah, as an infrastructure services company and the fact that we are working with only one kind of client, the ability to raise that uh, is also a matter of the kind of financial viability and the flexibility that the management has. Uh, the triple B plus credit rating that has been given to us is backed by the fact that there is a decent amount of cash in the system and the debt is also very easily serviceable. 
to be a debt free company uh, it is easy for us because basically uh, that would mean that if you stop bagging any contract for the next couple uh, with the next 3 and a half years we can throw off enough cash to be a debt free company for the first half the cash flow from operations was around uh, after working capital was around 90 odd crores and the total debt is around 380 or crores so within 4 years we will be a debt free entity in that sense uh, we would always like to have some debt because that helps us in kind of building for multiple projects at the same time not just bidding on one kind of a stream of uh, revenue right right okay fair enough and uh, if you can throw some light i know it's very early right now but if you can throw some light uh, what would be the entire process of collecting construction debt say the corporation will tell you collect the debt from a particular building or how is it like i mean if you can just explain the entire road map how the process would be done on ground level yeah so i mean as per the tender i mean we are supposed to collect wheels from western suburbs of mumbai so that's the area of jurisdiction that we have in our scope okay and then there are two seg- two types of uh, uh, segment two two set type of customers i would say one are the builders builders who are doing the who are taking up uh, redevelopment projects and are likely to to generate lot of debris so they are the people who uh, who are mandated to supply the waste to us uh, which we will carry and process at our site the second would be the smaller at the that you know at more at the Uh, at the ward level or at the sector level wherein people generating lesser quantity of construction debris but they would like to keep it outside their building or small building or something like that so you can say maybe some large builders and individual household owners who generate these two so that's the that's how the tender has specified these two type of customers right and the payment will still be received from the corporation although we might be picking maybe from a loda builder yeah. but the payment yeah. still uh, yeah as per the as per the mcg and bylaws whoever generates construction debris as part of their construction activities is supposed to inform bnc take their approval and deposit them a specified amount of fees okay which, uh, based on the volume of waste that they generate so that will accrue to the municipality and our revenue will come from uh, bnc based on the beverage data at our processing site okay there is no minimum of take guarantee that they provide you i mean that this many tons would be guaranteed from the corporation there is no of take guarantee but 600 tons per day is what the client has given a lot of data uh, during the I mean, in the tender in the independent document So 600 tons per day is what we are working with. Okay. And do we require any complex machinery for this, uh, you know, sort of conversion of this debris, or how is it like a bit difficult for us to understand? So this the uh, question. So I, mean, I, mean, I, guess, uh, I mean, explain it to in the thing, simple, in simple the thing. So there are two main equipment. One is uh, one is called the the jaw pressure and so on, uh, which is. that you when you get the waste you will have very very large size of the waste right so it has to be crushed so there is called jaw pressure so there is one equipment and the second equipment is uh, is the main processing is the core part which is which is what actually processes uh, based on wet washing process and that is something that we have procured from a company called CDE Asia which has supplied similar machinery for similar pro- uh, similar uh, uh, plants to at least 10 other projects in the country so we have gone for vendors with experience so these are the two set of equipment uh, which forms the the crux of the planning machinery perfect and where would this land be located where will be carrying out this entire processing this is at dahi sir dahi sir okay okay fair enough thank you so much yeah really helpful yeah Your next question comes from Harshil from Exposh. Please go ahead. Hello. So, so just wanted to understand that how much percentage of revenue that you are expected to get from uh, non-government business over it next two to next two to three years over a period of time. Because we are right now, what I understand is significant revenue change is coming from government to government municipal agency, municipal corporation. So, how much percentage we wanted to diversify over the next two to three years? 
Thank you. So, I mean, you know, it's difficult to put a number and we don't want to put a number, but, but let's say going forward, uh, let's say in five years from now, we want to have about uh, 15 to 20 percent of non-municipal revenue in five years in mind. And, and, and do we plan to get into any, any other uh, waste management, say, for example, any corporate waste management, or do you want to uh, focus on uh, e-waste management, or uh, do we want to have any such strategy, or do we have any plan to focus on those businesses or business schools? As I, as I explained at the beginning of this call, that in this entire recycling or the circular economy theme, we explored several segments. There is recycling of different types of waste. So we looked at e-waste, we looked at plastics, we looked at uh, tires, batteries, uh, auto recycling and so on. And we found, we thought that uh, given our experience, our synergies with existing core business, it is worthwhile to start with, to start with auto and tire recycling. And that's why we are working more on that, those two segments. As and when uh, things evolve in e-waste and plastics and other batteries, I and mean, then we will be exploring that as well. Okay, okay. I apologize because I, I, I could not attend at the beginning of the call, so I, I was not aware about it. Anyway, thank you. And, and, and how much revenue that you are expected to generate from people and uh, tire stretching over a period of next five to seven years, or when we start that, uh, the, the work on ground? So how much portfolio of, or, uh, of the percentage, uh, in terms of percentage that we, we look to generate revenue from those uh, streams? Too early, it is too, uh, I mean, it's very early to, to, to give any number or a commitment on that. I mean, because as I uh, <coughs> said that, you know, these, policies, these uh, segments are contingent on, uh, on, on, first of all, it was contingent on the government coming up with a clear policy, which they have done, which is a very huge, uh, which is a huge positive. And then comes the point of view of the implementation of this. Right, so we see more traction in auto recycling and so on. That's why we thought we'll get into that. But in terms of the size, in terms of viability, in terms of you know how the consolidation will happen in this business, that is something which probably is too early. We are very early days for this segment. Okay. Okay. And and one last question: that how much uh, the, the, the currently I can see the receivable of around 250 crores in dollars, right? And we have balance sheet size of 1,260 crores. So approximately one fifth of receivable is uh, one fifth of our asset is is locked in receivable. So how much sustainable receivable that we expected to see uh, on uh, on a over period of time? Because 250 crores on a revenue of 800 or 900 crores, uh, do you think that is, is it uh, on higher side or this should remain uh, uh, sustainable over for a longer period of time? Um, so the receivables, you need to look at it in two points. One is there is also an unbuilt uh, revenue component which says, which is like one month of revenue because uh, the billing for waste management, let it be collection, transportation or processing is on a monthly basis. So at the end of the month, the bill gets raised. So that uh, component sits as receivables as an unbuilt revenue which is not sent out. One. The second is also the tender has a retention policy wherein uh, percentage of a revenue is kept on hold and released to the operator at the end of the contract. So these are the two components which kind of adds to the number of around 200 plus that we are referring to. The retention amount by itself is around 48 crores uh, and uh, your uh, unbilled revenue would be in the range of around 80 to uh, 70 to 80 crores. So both of them together is around 120 crores by themselves. So the net effective uh, receivables uh, that we should be worried about or looked at would be in the range of 120 to 130 odd crores. And uh, the management is uh, very uh, astutely aware of the money that gets uh, stuck here because this money would actually help us fuel our growth. So if you look at our day sales receivables, we have been trying to work it at around, it's still at 78 if I'm not wrong and that is something that uh, the management uh, is definitely working on and uh, uh, any benefit from that will definitely help us for the uh, equity contribution to new projects for us. Okay. And, and do we have any plan to give any dividend in uh, this year? Uh, the board is considering this option, but that's a technicality so which we need to look at. At the standalone level, uh, the company's uh, projects are not significant. The company has a lot of revenues in the downstream uh, 
entity which is uh, your ag environment anthony lara so uh, as part of that uh, we have started with the first step of merging uh, few two of our wholly owned subsidiary into one large wholly owned subsidiary maybe it's a long term process for us to kind of make it streamlined and push the funds into the listed entity to make it the most tax efficient way of uh, declaring dividends or uh, taking the funds out so that is one way that we are looking at uh, but to answer your question uh, the board has discussed about uh, dividends at uh, various forums and we definitely would be uh, looking at that sometime in the next year thank you thank you The next question comes from Uma from Foreign Tree. Please go ahead. Hi. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just wanted to understand uh, you've mentioned some three uh, new projects. Uh, could you throw some light on the numbers of those projects? And the. So we were talking about. The margins would be similar to the uh, uh, to the. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Mm. The next question comes from Bavia Gandhi from Dalao and Dorchas of Talking. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So I just wanted to know, is there any thought process behind this group restructuring? Are we planning to, you know, sort of delist or uh, relist or, you know, create some value addition out of this uh, different uh, entities within the main entity itself? Yeah, that's the first question. Uh, so the idea behind the corporate restructuring is just to clean up the corporate structure because there are multiple uh, subsidiaries and all of them are only one subsidiary. So that adds to a line of compliances, additional uh, managerial uh, oversight. So just it was purely meant to clean up the org structure, have two, three lines of activity, processing, collection, transportation, thereabouts. So that was the reason. The, the main reason why these companies were formed uh, was because of the Section 80I tax benefit under the minimum alternate tax. So since that is no more required, uh, we wanted to do that. and. Uh, we just got delayed on that aspect and now we are just trying to get it done. Right. And with respect to vehicle scrapping, uh, will there be a tendering process or we have to, you know, sort of go to the customers directly and ask for the scrappage, if you can just throw slight on that front as well. So uh, the vehicle scrapping policy is that you have to apply with the state transportation department uh, for the license to set up this plant. Okay, and then they have already issued uh, guidelines in terms of what all need to be there. For example, they need to be two acres of land, and, and then there are a few more conditions that one has to meet. Based on which license will be given. So these are merchant plans, so there is no tendering required as far as getting these products are concerned. Uh, for the vehicles, uh, but if your question is also about how will we source the vehicle, is that the question? Yeah, source as well as license. If you can throw some light on the license as well. So I didn't understand what do you mean by license and if there's a difference between the tender and license, getting a license, I mean. So, so, it's, so it's like this. So when we are, uh, okay, let's say if we want to do a project in uh, state of, in the city of Bangalore. Okay, so then we have to go to the, uh, to the Bangalore City Transportation Department, uh, Transportation Commissioner and then okay. apply for a license. So okay. there are certain conditions which they have given. If we meet that, 
including having land of minimum two acres and so on. So then the commissioner will give us approval or you can say license or approval for setting up this facility. Okay. Oh. And setting up this facility is, uh, is, is like any setting up any other factory, which is infinitely going to be a merchant plant. So that's why to answer your question, there is no tendering process required to get such projects. Okay. It is based on our own market, uh, market study and survey and, uh, and, and the attractiveness, attractiveness of the location that we can decide which city or which state we want to go to. Okay. And similarly on the sourcing part, so then once you get the license, how do you source the scrappage? So the sourcing of vehicles, I mean, uh, the, as per the policy, any vehicle, any diesel vehicle which is more than 10 years or any petrol vehicle which is more than 15 years need to be scrapped. So, which, which basically means that that vehicle owner has to come to such a facility, uh, apply, uh, I mean, give the vehicle for scrapping, and then we as a facility will have to scrap it and cancel the registration of that vehicle at the Wahan website, which is the MRTH website for registered vehicles and then give him a certificate within a specified number of days. So that would mean that the vehicle is officially officially scrapped. Okay, and uh, in terms of sourcing of these vehicles, either customers can come to us because, I mean, there would be not too many such facilities in a given city. So depending on what is convenient, so vehicle can, the owner can approach us directly or, uh, but, but then apart from that, we also will have a website, we also have an app under which people can actually uh, sign up for that. Uh, then there are also these uh, uh, insurance companies or, uh, or, or these, uh, you know, the police, police, depart huh, police department or dealers, you know, who, uh, who, have this who have this inventory of old vehicles. So that would be uh, sourced from that. The tendering for such vehicles would only be in the case because I think some of these PS, public sector undertakings, PSUs or government departments, they auction their charged vehicles. So for that, we will have to pay them. Okay, got it, got it. Thank you so much. Really helpful. Thank you so much. As there are no further questions from the participants, I now hand the conference over to Mr. Jacob for closing comments. I wish to convey my heartfelt gratitude to our community team whose tireless efforts have played a pivotal role in accomplishing our goals. My sincere appreciation goes out to our valued clients and stakeholders for their unwavering support. Together, we have forged a robust and successful company, and I am optimistic that our path towards a cleaner and greener future will be marked by continued success. Wish you all a joyous Diwali and a prosperous New Year. Thank you. On behalf of Anthony Waste Handling Cell Limited, that, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.